Okay, good morning, folks. Good to see you. Happy Mother's Day to you mothers and anyone else that wants to get in on that. Uh, we're, we're in the uh, Early Earth series, and we're up to the day six. So if you take your Bibles, please, and turn to the first chapter of Genesis once again. <coughs> Genesis chapter one, and we're going to read just two verses. Now we're actually going to cover more than two verses, but I'd like to uh, leave these two verses with you. And God said, this is verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And those two verses, we read that phrase, after his kind, we read it five, five times there. And um, uh, we have it 10 times total in the first chapter of Genesis. Just that phrase, after this kind, puts the word of God at variance with the theory of evolution. Because the theory of evolution does not believe in reproduction after its kind, exclu uh, exclusive reproduction after its kind. So let's look to God in prayer, and we're gonna look at the beasts of the field and so forth that were created after their own kind. Heavenly Father, now we come before you in Jesus' precious name. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God, and we believe it's the final authority in all matters. Lord, men say this and that and the other thing, and then they change their mind and they get the uh, reputation of being experts in their field, and then it keeps changing and so forth. But the word of God is unchangeable, and it's not to be added unto or subtracted from or to be changed or altered in any manner. And Lord, just let God be true and every man a liar. And so, Lord, we just cling to the word of God as the ultimate truth. And Lord, as we look at this uh, day six in the creation week, Lord, we pray that we, our hearts will be ministered to by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that you would bless and edify your people this day in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the um, God creates everything and they reproduce after their kind. Both man and mammals, both are created on day six. Now on day five, God created fish and fowl, water dwelling creatures and uh, flying creatures. They were created on day five. And now, now we come to day six, man and mammals. Now all of the characteristics of God's creation are programmed into those creatures that were created on day six on, uh, of creation week. In other words, what we're saying here is there is a great variety within the species that God created. He created uh, all of these land, well, mammals, uh, basically. He created these mammals, but there was a great variety within the family of each individual mammal. And we're gonna look at, today we're gonna to look at dogs. And um, God created two dogs. No doubt they lived in the Garden of Eden for a while with Adam and Eve. Maybe they played, Adam and Eve played with them, we don't know. We have no idea what those two dogs looked like. But they reproduced, they had other dogs and, and so forth. Well, by the time we get to Noah, and the ark, God is about to destroy the earth, and God tells Noah to take two of each kind upon the ark. So what does Noah do? Does he go, <coughs> pardon me, does Noah go and get two poodles, two Great Danes, two Dachshunds, two German Shepherds, two Collies? No, he takes two dogs, and he takes these two dogs upon the ark, and after the flood, flood waters subside, these two dogs come out of the ark, and every dog that's on the face of the earth today is a descendant of those two dogs. And 
the dogs that are on the earth today, there is such a variety. Day six is the day that man was created, and it's interesting that six is the number of man. Six is man's number. Well, <clears throat> we see variety within the species, and as we're focusing on, the, on dogs today, we see that within that species, there are all kinds of dogs. They, dogs that don't look anything alike. Dogs that are all different sizes. There's, there's uh, uh, look at that cute little guy in the middle there. Isn't he cute? <laughs> That's Barney. <laughs> But there, there's, there's big dogs and little dogs. There's black dogs, white dogs, brown dogs, spotted dogs. There's dogs with long hair, short hair, curly hair. All kinds of variety within the species. species. Huge dogs, little tiny dogs like a, a Mexican Chihuahua and huge dogs like a Great Dane and a St. Bernard and so forth. So um, all of them are related. They all came from those same two dogs that came off the ark in the days of Noah. God didn't create poodles, Great Danes, fox terriers, and so forth. He created two dogs. And those two dogs that he created, he programmed into the genetic structure of those dogs all of the information to cover this whole dog family here and all of the others. This is just a, a very few of the variety of dogs. He programmed into uh, those dogs, the original dogs, all of the information that uh, shows up in, for instance, a little uh, a white dog or a big uh, a different colored dog or uh, any, any of these. He programs into, into, the, into their genes all of this, all of this information, it's, it, it's all there. Now, as dogs reproduce, we have different varieties of dogs, and during all this time, there is no new information being programmed into their genetic structure. No new information at all. In fact, when these new, uh, um, when a new breed is uh, a new breed of dog comes along, it's actually a loss of genetic information. They, uh, two uh, two dogs will two, will be isolated and reproduce, and and then they they in turn their offspring will will uh, reproduce, and it results in a loss of genetic information. Now that is absolutely contrary to the theory of evolution. Because the theory of evolution states that, uh, or believes, that new information should be coming along all the time. In other words, the theory of evolution believes that we be began as a little one cell amoeba or something like that and, ev and continuously evolved upward and, and uh, came uh, apes and chimpanzees and, and finally human beings. And, and if that was true, if there was new information being programmed into the, the genetic structure of, God, of this creation, there would be new uh, uh, species developing. There would be, uh, there would be uh, all kinds of uh, new, something new uh, beyond human beings and, and so forth. But there's a loss of information and we're going to look at that loss of information here uh, this morning. Over time, a loss of, inform uh, of information occurs. Those two dogs, they got off the ark, they mated, they had puppies, those puppies matured, they made it, they had more puppies and so forth. And as the population of the earth was separated and spread over across the face of the earth, uh, they took dogs with them, of course, and so you have a separating of the gene pool in which, uh, uh, of these dogs. That gene pool becomes reduced and so, each separate group contains certain characteristics which are retained and there are certain things that are lost. Now for instance, a poodle. That's one of the most disgusting little animals that there are. <laughs> a poodle, there's absolutely no, 
no uh, resemblance between a poodle and a wolf or a poodle and a greyhound, for instance. There, there, there's just no, no, uh, uh, no link between them all, but they're both dogs. And in theory, a poodle and a greyhound could, could mate and, and produce puppies and so forth, but a poodle looks nothing like any of those other kinds. Why is that? Well, because there's been a loss of information. As groups of dogs separated, there was less and less genetic information uh, in, in each group and so forth. And so actually they begin to breed downward. Now on the next few pages, we got some pictures for you. And uh, first of all, we're starting out there. It says dogs change into different dogs. Dogs change into different dogs. Here we have a variety of dogs. And the Bible says in Genesis 1, five times in verse 24 and 25, after their kind. So you can get all of this variety of dogs, but they're all dogs. They can interbreed with one another. They're all dogs. And so we have a name for this. <coughs> Pardon me. And it's called microevolution. Microevolution is real. There is changes within a species. Genetic changes within a species produces this great variety of dogs that we have here. And uh, that's called microevolution. Micro and it's real, the proof of it is, look how many varieties of dogs there are. Look how many varieties of human beings there are. Look how many varieties of, of most anything that there, that there is. So all breeds of dogs are still dogs. They're still dogs. Big dogs, little dogs, black dogs, white dogs, uh, uh, all kinds of dogs, but they're still always dogs. And by the same token, all races of men are still men. Now, in the next picture, underneath their variation within the dog kind, here we have the dog's parents. Now, in their genetic structure, there can be capital A, small a, capital B, small b, capital C, small c. That can be true in both the male and the female. So they're going to mate. What kind of puppies are they going to have? Well, look at down in the, uh, the lower uh, part there. There's all kinds of possible in, um, uh, offspring combinations that can come from that. It can be capital AA, capital BB, capital CC. Or it can be small a, small a, small b, small b, small c, small c. Or, or any of this, this variety. You have all of this variety within the genetic structure of the dog, and so um, God programmed all that in, into the dog right from the beginning. Now over the years, over the centuries, over the millennia, there has been a steady loss of information. No new information has been added. If evolution was true, there would be new information being added, but there isn't. The trend is downward. The second law of thermodynamics states that all that the trend of everything in, in creation and in nature is downward and uh, from order to disorder, from uh, organization to chaos and, and so forth. Everything deteriorates. It doesn't get better with age. It doesn't get better with time. Now, going to the next page, it's an example of that. Here we have Let's say a man takes his dogs and he moves to the north, way up north where it's cold. Gets up into the Arctic Circle. Now, what kind of dogs live up in the Arctic Circle? Well, there's wolves, for one thing. There's husky sled dogs. Those animals can survive, they can live outside when it's 60 degrees below zero because they've got this thick fur. It's just absolutely unbelievable. Now you go up there to the Arctic Circle and you won't find any Mexican Chihuahua hairless dogs, and you won't find any poodles and anything like that. 
Now, here's what evolution says. Evolution says that the dogs that went, moved to the north there, they adapted to the new climate. Now stop and think about the stupidity of that. They adapted to the new climate. Suppose you went up there and all of a sudden it's, uh, now you're, you're, you're a dog now, not, not a human being, you're a dog. And you go up there, you little thin fur creature, and oh, it's terribly cold. You, you need a heavy coat. Well, how could you adapt to get a heavy coat? Is, is something going to be programmed within you to all of a sudden your hair is going to start growing longer and thicker and, and so forth, your, your metabolism changes and so forth? No, nothing like that could happen. What's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to die from the cold. So what happens here? It's not a case of the, the case of, of the dog adapting to the climate. It's a case of the ones that are equipped to survive in that climate that do so. So that's why up in the, the cold Arctic you have wolves and you have husky sled dogs and so forth. All the others died out. <coughs> now by the same token, you go down to where it's hot. You get down there around the equator. Would an Arctic wolf or a husky sled dog, would they survive at the equator? No. If they were ever there, they died out. They couldn't take the heat. What do you have down there? You have dogs with thin fur, and uh, they're the only ones that can survive there. Now, this is what Darwin experienced when he went to the Galapagos Islands. And he noticed that on the different islands, there was differences within the species of the different creatures on the island. And he called this evolution. Well, it is evolution, but it is microevolution. It is changes within the species. And that can be affected by the climate. It can be affected by diet. It can be affected by um, uh, any number of different things, but birds remained birds, dogs remained dogs, cats remained cats, and, and so forth. And so, um, as, the, as the dogs separated here, some of them are up to the north there in the cold, some are down the equator here where it's hot, and the gene pool suffers from that because uh, all the, the, the genetic structure that would put a heavy coated furry wolf type dog uh, up to the north there uh, is going to die out down in the, near the equator. And so what does it, what does it happen? What, what does it result in? It's a further loss of information. And this goes on until we have lots and lots of varieties of dogs. The uh, dogs today do not have all that information that was originally programmed into them because there's been a great loss of, of information. Now notice on the next picture, we have the wolf, the coyote, the dingo, they have those over in Australia, collies, poodles down at the bottom where they belong. Uh, all of that results as a loss of information. There's no new information added to it at all. Then you throw in a few mutations. Here in the next picture down at the right hand corner, here's the parent dogs. They got four normal legs. But something happens when they breed and there's a copying error, a little genetic mutation here, and off comes a offspring here with for stubby legs. And so here again is a further loss of, in, of information. So uh, this is changes within the species. It can be a change in the color of their coat, the size, anything like that. Okay, going to the next page. Here's two dogs. God created two dogs. Noah took two dogs upon the ark. They, they came off the ark, they began to reproduce, and today, <coughs> We got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of dogs. We got dogs all over the place today. Now notice the little circles there. 
all the dogs within each circle, if you were to take them and off to one side or one, one area, they would interbreed with each other and all of the genetic information that's in these other dogs is, is going to be lost. And that's where the different breeds of dogs come from. That's micro evolution. Now you can do the same thing with the human race. And it has happened in the, within the human race. At the Tower of Babel, the man was, was separated according to language. And so as one group went here, one group went there, one group went here, there's another genetic loss of information. And so you, you have Adam, and, and, and then you have, uh, later on you have Noah, and then you have the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and through them the whole world has been populated. But as they, they went in separate groups to do it. And so in the human race, you have hair. Hair that is blonde, brown, black, red, straight, curly, kinky, great variety of hair, but it's all human beings. And look at people's noses. You got big noses, long noses, flat noses, short noses, wide noses. When we were over in the Philippines, the, the, most of the people in the Philippines can speak English because they learn it in school, but the little kids, they, uh, they don't know English yet. They still speak to, uh, Tagalog. And this one little girl, she kept pointing to me and laughing, and I didn't know what she was talking about. And uh, she was saying something, but as in Tagalog, I didn't understand her. And um, uh, finally her mother told me, she says, she calls you long nose. <laughs> well, the, the people over in the Philippines, they got flat noses, you know, and short, small noses. There's all kinds of variety in, in noses and hair, lips, thick lips, uh, thin lips, so forth. Height, there's some places where the genetic pool is, uh, reproduces big people, all quite tall people. Then there's another group, it's pygmies, they're all small, and so forth. There's skin, difference in, in the skin color, and uh, uh, could be in red, yellow, black, or white, as the, as the song says. Eyes, eyes are all different. Some are brown eyes, blue eyes, gray eyes. Uh, slanted eyes, different uh, round eyes, a different different kind of eye. All of this is micro evolution. It's changes within the species. And as the Word of God says here, ten times in Genesis chapter one, it is after their own kind. <coughs> Pardon me. So there are dogs, but they're after their own kind. There are so many varieties of dogs, you couldn't list them all. But they're all after their own kind. Now, if there could be a crossover, like the evolutionists claim, and a fish over time could turn into a frog, evolve into a frog, that is called macroevolution. And macroevolution is impossible. But macroevolution is what the entire theory of evolution is based upon. That there can be a crossover from one species to another species. And it is impossible. It could not possibly ever, ever happen. Microevolution happens all the time. Changes within the species. And usually the evolutionist will hold up an example of microevolution and say that's the proof of evolution. And they use, used to use the, over in England, they used to use the pepper moth. And they say, see, some were, some were light colored and others were dark colored. And, and when the Industrial Revolution came along and the, the uh, atmosphere was filled with smoke and everything, all the light colored moths died out. Well, that was true because the birds could see them <laughs> easier than the, than the dark colored moths. It has nothing to do with, uh, with evolution at all. And even though they died out, they were still moths. There was no change of species. Macroevolution can never, ever possibly happen. In each of the uh, chromosomes of man, we each, each cell within our body, there are 48 chromosomes. And in, in the reproductive cells of men, there are 24. And so when there is a mating between the male and the female, 24 and 24 makes 
48. And so there is reproduction. So every cell in your body, other than the reproductive cells, have 48 chromosomes. That's man's number, 48 chromosomes. And man, that's why man can only reproduce human babies, each one with the chromosome count of 48. Now evolution says that we evolved from monkeys. Well, a monkey has a chromosome number of 54. It would be impossible for a 48 and a 54 to, uh, to reproduce. There's no way monkeys could have evolved into men. Now there's an <coughs> article we just came across, it's in your note sheets, where, um, um, oh, I find it here. No, maybe I don't have it here. Um, where the, um, the mating of the chimpanzees it's in your sheets, I know there. I know it is. Oh, here it is. It says, you may be a monkey's uncle. This is from just one year ago, May 19th of 2006. And this was a study that was done in Harvard and, the, and MIT. And uh, it says, they examined the genetic record of humans and chimpanzees. Now, these are prominent scientists in prestigious schools. And it says, by studying more than 31,000 bits of the genetic structure measuring how closely humans are related to chimpanzees, the scientists were able to study how quickly the two species became different from each other. The research team found that it took at least, and this, you gotta laugh at this. The research team found that it took at least hundreds of thousands of years and perhaps as long as four million years for human and chimpanzee ancestors to stop interbreeding. How could they possibly, even if it was true, how could they possibly know how long it took? Well, first of all, it's impossible, it never happened. Humans and chimpanzees never did interbreed with each other. And it goes on and states that humans and chimpanzees were interbreeding for all this time before finally separating more than 6.3 million years ago and probably less than 5.4 million years ago. They just pull these numbers millions of years out of the air, just out of thin air. And, and they're so happy with the results of their research and now they're gonna start studying gorillas and orangutans. And so, did, he, did human beings ever uh, interbreed with chimpanzees or orangutans or, or anything else? Absolutely not, it could not have possibly have ever happened. Uh, why would you want to in the first place? But it, it could not possibly happen. Man's chromosome number is 48. Monkey's chromosome number is 54. So does that mean that monkeys are more highly evolved than man? He's got more chromosomes than man does. I don't think so. And cats and dogs can cats and dogs breed and mate together? No, it's impossible. They have a different chromosome number. Now if cats and dogs could breed, their offspring, I guess you would say they would be dats and cogs. But it can't happen, so don't worry about it. The chromosome number for a cat is 36. And the chromosome number for a horse it's 38. Maybe that means that the cat and the horse evolved together and at one time were, were one and the same. Now, does, it, uh, does this mean there's only a small difference between a cat and a horse? Well, just look at them, you'll find there's, there's, a, lot, there's a big difference between them. A cat and a horse, if, if they could breed, they'd have kit colts. But again, a fruit fly has <coughs> has eight chromosomes per cell. So, oh, well, hey, that's a fruit fly. You know, way down there, the bottom, uh, bottom order of, of, uh, of the, the creation there, uh, uh, just a little crummy little insect. Uh, so he, he's only got eight chromosomes per cell. Yeah, but there's some insects that have over 1,600 chromosomes per cell. And so, how do you explain all this? 
And if evolution were true, we would see the chromosome number ranging from the highest life form, which would be man, down to the lowest, which would be a, a little uh, uh, insect or uh, maybe even a one-cell creature. Man should have the highest chromosome number that, that there is. So macroevolution is not possible. It cannot happen. Now you can take a mule, or I did, I'm sorry, you can take a, a jackass and a mare, and they can mate, and it will produce a mule. Or you can take a male horse and a female donkey and mate them, and it will produce what they call a hinny. But does this teach macroevolution? Here are two closely related species that have mated together and have actually reproduced. But it's a dead end. Both of a mule and a henny are sterile. They can't, they can't reproduce. So, so even if these mutations that the uh, evolutionist talks about, they could uh, two species get together and actually produce an offspring, it's a dead end. There's nowhere to go. They, they're sterile. They cannot reproduce. So macroevolution is not at all possible. Now, God says that man's blood is different from the blood of any other animal. Did you know that? That's in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. The Bible says, And he hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the earth. He hath made of one blood. Human blood is different from any other kind of blood. Each species has a very special, particular kind of blood. And when men begin to realize the truth of, the, of Leviticus 17.11 that says the life of the flesh is in the blood, when they begin to realize the truth of that, uh, they decide, well, maybe if we, uh, a person is bleeding to death, we can give them a blood transfusion. Great idea. But what they fail to recognize is what it says in Acts 17.26. He hath made of one blood all nations of men. So the very first blood transfusions, the people that got them died because they took blood of sheep and put it into, into the human being. Sheep's blood, or any kind of animal's blood, is incompatible with human blood. The people died. The light, uh, God hath made of one flesh, of one blood, rather, all nations of men. So human blood and animal blood are incompatible. Now, the blood of a horse is closer to human blood far more closer than that of an ape or a chimpanzee, but nobody suggests we evolved from horses. And the milk from a rat is much closer to human milk than a cow's milk is. Aren't you glad? Who'd want to go out and milk the rats every morning? But <laughs> nobody suggests that we evolved from rats. No, in Genesis chapter 1 here, 10 times in this chapter, after their own kind. Three times concerning vegetation in verse 11 and 12, and then uh, two more times in verse 21 after fish and fowl, and then the rest of the time here, verses 24 through, uh, through tw and 25, ten times after their own kind. And no one has ever been able to, dis to disprove that in any way, shape, form, or matter. Now, evolution keeps on trying, kind of like the Energizer Bunny. Keep on trying. And so every once in a while, they, they come up with a new fossil. And these fossils are to uh, teach what is impossible to happen, macro evolution, a uh, uh, part ape, part human. And, and so forth. But every one has been proven to be a fraud. We're not going to get much into that today, but we will a little more next time. However, the darling of the evolutionary world right now is Lucy. Did you ever hear of, of Lucy? Lucy was on the cover of Time magazine back in the, in the 1970s. There she is. That's Lucy there. And um, 
Lucy was considered to be a fantastic find. This was, Lucy was an important link in the theory of evolution because Lucy is supposed to be an intermediary that was able to, ape-like as she is, that was supposed to walk, be able to walk upright. She could walk upright and only man walks upright. And so Lucy was considered to be a fantastic, absolutely fantastic find. And um, the man who, uh, that found her, Dr. Johansson, he said, and this is from National Geographic, December 1976, he says, the angle of the thigh bone and the flattened surface of the knee joint end proved that she walked on two legs. Now, let's look at what they found of Lucy. There she is, okay? Now, notice she doesn't have any hands and she doesn't have any feet. As a matter of fact, she's only got one leg. Now, see right there, that little bone right there, that is the knee joint. And this is the thing that is supposed to prove evolution, this one little knee joint right here. This is it proves that Lucy, this ape-like creature, walked upright like a man. And Dr. Johansson said that even before he assembled all of Lucy's remaining bones, he could see that she had been bipedal, which means she's able to walk upright, and the clue was a telling knee joint right there. there there's, there's the telling thing to show that she was much more human-like than chimp-like. So this is heralded as a great scientific discovery. Well, 12 years go by, Dr. Johansson is at the University of Missouri, and he's lecturing and telling about the knee joint of Lucy. He has his audience enthralled. However, there was a creationist in the, in the audience, and when they had question time, the creationist asked him, how far away from Lucy did you find this knee joint? Well, that's an honest question. And he hemmed and hawed and hedged and so forth, but the creationist kept pressing him. Well, how far away did you find this knee joint? Finally, he admitted. The knee joint of Lucy was found at a depth 200 feet lower than Lucy, the rest of Lucy, and at a distance of a mile and a half away. <laughs> Folks, this is what Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.20, science falsely so-called. Science falsely so-called. Just think if you were up at the corner of M59 <laughs> and Airport Road and you found a skull up there. And uh, so you want to dig, you dig around, you find maybe, maybe find the rest of the, of the skeleton. And uh, uh, so you, you go way down by, by just about almost to Pontiac Lake Road. And you're digging around and you go, you just keep digging and digging, you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and you're not finding anything. Pretty soon you find a knee bone down at Pontiac Lake Road. You found a skull up here. And you say, well, that's, that's the knee bone that belonged to this skull. What, how ridiculous is that? But the scientific community that scoffs at the Word of God uh, accepts this with a straight face. <coughs> and, and so it's, uh, uh, it's science, falsely, so-called. Now, recently, just, um, just last November, there was something that is, uh, comes along that is supposed to support Lucy. In fact, it's called Lucy's Child. There he is, Lucy's Child. This is National Geographic of November 2006. And this one is better than Lucy because it's a skeleton that is almost complete. They got, they've got the whole thing here. And they, they, they know it's not Lucy's child, but they're calling it that because it's supposed to be the next generation from Lucy as, as she becomes less ape-like and more human-like. And so they find this 
this uh, fossil, but then some other scientists began to examine it. They found some interesting things about it. First of all, the hyoid bone is exactly like that of a chimpanzee. Now you say, what is the hyoid bone? Well, that's the bone that is in a, it's right below the tongue that allows us to speak. Now the hyoid bone in a human being is a, a U-shape, but in a chimp or an ape, it's a T-shape. Apes cannot talk. Gorillas can't talk. Chimpanzees cannot talk. They don't have the power of speech. They could never possibly have the power of speech because the hyoid bone is, is the wrong shape. And so she was definitely not human. That's a, nice, that's a nice picture to show you on Mother's Day, isn't it? Lucy's child. Then secondly, they found the organ of balance in this skeleton was chimp-like, not human. You ever see the way a chimpanzee walks? They waddle. Waddle like that. Definitely not human. And then they found, and this is a, a biggie, the neck vertebrae were short and thick like a chimpanzee's. You know, the, 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 uh, on a human, the skull sits up on, on the spinal column at, at the top. On an ape, it's out in the front. Have you ever noticed that? Well, this is definitely an ape. And then they found that the fingers, remember Lucy, there was no hands or feet on Lucy. And so the artists have drawn feet and hands on Lucy with long curved fingers. Well, the fingers are long and curved like a chimpanzee's. So they know, uh, uh, certainly wasn't human. And then the shoulder blades are the, exactly the same as a gorilla and not like at all like a human. And then finally the kicker is the cranial capacity falls into the range of that of a chimpanzee. It's got a little small brain. And so Lucy's child, Lucy goes up in ashes and Lucy's child goes up in ashes because when you closer examination, they have found absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing at all. Well, the evolutionists have come up with something brand new. This is, this is just brand new. Now they've had, tr had trouble with fossils. They have always loved to display fossils and show the progression of, uh, from ape-like to human-like and so forth. And almost every one of their fossils, in fact, every one of their fossils has been proven to be a fraud or false, one of the two. We'll, we'll see a little more about that next week. And so the fossil record has really backfired on them. And so now they've got a new idea. This is at the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York. This, this will blow your mind. They are displaying in their museum, they are displaying a test tube that's supposed to contain the DNA of a Neanderthal man. Now they're, what they're doing is they're putting, they're combining DNA and fossils to show human history. Well, folks, you can stand and look at that test tube till the cows come home, and it looks like an empty test tube, got a little water or something in it, but it's just supposed to be the DNA of a uh, of a Neanderthal man who was supposed to be part ape and part, part human. The uh, president of the museum says it's the first major exhibit hall that's kind to present the fossil and the genetic record side by side, okay? Offering new and compelling evidence that tells a grand and sweeping story of man. Grand and compelling evidence, a little empty test tube next to a fossil that proves nothing. Organizers of the exhibit uh, exhibit hall wanted to incorporate genetic research because they said it illustrates links between organisms in ways that are often difficult for fossils. Fossils have proved to be a total fraud. Now we got something that's invisible, supposed to be in a test tube, and that's going to convince people. Who can argue with a test tube? You know, you can't. Well, the argument that they use is that chimpanzees and human beings are 99% alike. 
Therefore, humans must have evolved from chimpanzees. Even though they know it could not pass, possibly happen, that's macroevolution. 99% alike. Well, you know, you can buy a Cadillac or you can buy a Chevy. And you know what? That Chevy will be more than 99% more than like that Cadillac. Oh, the Cadillac is bigger and more beautiful and it's got more gadgets and so forth, but over 99% of it will be the same thing that's on a Chevy. The, the same basic thing is going to be wheels and a chassis and a body and, and a motor and, and, and all of that. Now, why are they so similar? Because General Motors made both of them. And why would a chimp and a human being be similar? Because the same God made both of them. And there's a big difference between a Chevy and a Cadillac. And there's a big difference between a chimp and a human being. There's a crossover, there's a, <coughs> there's a gap there <coughs> that could not possibly ever be crossed. A number of years ago, <coughs> scientists conducted a, a, a study for many, many years about on apes. And they came to the conclusion, this was done at uh, government expense, taxpayers' expense. They came to the conclusion, after many years of study, that apes can't talk. Now that was profound. Apes cannot talk. All they had to do was look at the hominid bone in the ape and they would know. They, they can't talk. They never could talk, in spite of the planet of the apes, you know. Uh, they could not possibly ever talk. It, it would have been impossible. So, uh, microevolution, yes, it happens. Macroevolution cannot possibly happen. And the whole Darwinian theory of evolution is resting on that idea of macroevolution. Now, uh, that brings us to the end of the class today. If you want any of the back lessons, they're all laying up on the steps here. We got a few more weeks to go in this series. Um, and uh, then we'll be wrapping it up. But if you want any of the back lessons, they're up here. Okay, let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Now, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. And Lord, we believe every word in your precious book. And your word says that you, your creation was after its own kind, whether it be vegetation, fish, fowl, mammals, or man. Lord, it's after its own kind, and we rightly believe it, Lord, and let God be true and every man a liar. So we just thank you for the word of God. May we never doubt it. May we never allow the science falsely so-called of this world to cause doubts within our heart. But may we cling to the truth of God. Dismiss us with your blessing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.